Well, in literature, there's a technique that is called a reversal. And you see this all the time. You just didn't know what it was, but it's a reversal. What happens is when they're writing a story, it could be in movies or books or children's books do it a lot of times too, cartoons. What they do is they introduce, the author introduces some new piece of information that sheds light on the greater truth. So you were thinking it was one thing, and then the truth, this new information comes, you're like, Oh, that's what was going on. Now I get it. There was a movie about 22 years ago um, called The Sixth Sense. And I'm not going to say what that movie's about, but that has a reversal in it. You're like, oh, so I'm not recommending you watch that or not. Do whatever you want to do. But there's a reversal in that. There's a uh, cartoon from 1936 uh, called Mickey's trailer, and I want you to watch this. If there's any kids here, it's not like this every week, but today, a special treat, short one-minute video here, and look for the reversal. Oh, boy, what a thing. Welcome to church, everybody. <laughs> There's a reversal in this. And so they are not actually in the country at a nice vacation house. They are in a trailer, and they're at the city dump. And so that's the reversal. You say, oh, that's where they always were, but we just didn't know it. And I used some wisdom and showed a scene from Mickey as opposed to the sixth sense today. And I do make good decisions from time to time. But this is a reversal. A new piece of information is introduced. And this isn't new. It's been going on through the ages to get a little twist in the story. And uh, Aristotle talked about this uh, idea, a way to do things. And Jesus, as well, uses this idea of a reversal. We're in this uh, series. We've been going verse by verse. Those of you that are new here to the church, we've been going verse by verse through the Gospel of Luke, and we happen to find ourselves in Luke 16. And in this parable, the teaching uh, is about the rich man and Lazarus. <clears throat> and it's a difficult passage, a difficult message. And I've titled the message, The Unexpected Reversal. There's a reversal we're going to see here, several. And Jesus masterfully does this as he teaches, trying to help the Pharisees and those who are outside of faith in God to really understand what it means to follow God. Last week, Pastor Jason taught and was speaking about how the Pharisees were lovers of money. And you can see now this is just a continuation of that. Jesus wants to hammer home this idea of love of money because you can't serve two masters. You either serve God or you serve money. And so he uses an example of life. This is a made-up story. This didn't happen. He's just trying to tug on the hearts of people to understand what it's like to either follow God or reject God. That's where we're heading today. Luke 16. If you don't have a physical Bible, you could pull it up on a phone like the Bible app. It's good to read along as we go because you'll see that I'm not making this up. These are Jesus' own words. The Word of God is so good for us. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Jesus is painting a picture here. First thought today, compassion for people over selfish greed. Compassion for people over selfish greed. Again, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. This picture is being painted of this man. Purple, the color of royalty, a king's color. 
and he's got food. It is rich, sumptuous food, and he eats it at his will every day. And the linen clothes that he wears feel so luxurious on his body. Great food, great clothes every day. Now, there's a lot of things in culture that has shifted over the years, like that culture that's listening to this. They didn't have iPhones. They didn't even have this Bible that we're able to open up so easily. Uh, they didn't have cars. They didn't have telephones. They didn't have all these things that we have in our day. But one thing that has stayed the same throughout culture, even with these shifts, is the fact that money can cause people some problems. Same thing. It hasn't changed. Most people, like me included, if you're given a choice between being, I've read the beginning of the parable, if you're given a choice between being the rich man or the man at the gate, Lazarus, with the sores, you're going to do like me. I'd rather be the rich guy. I'd rather have all these things taken care of for me because we don't want to be uncomfortable. We wouldn't choose to be in this situation. We wouldn't make a decision to be poor. This is understandable. It is natural. Uh, when I was a kid, there was a show on TV called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous with Robin Leach. And Robin Leach would take us into the homes and jets and villas in Italy and uh, the restaurants that the richest of the rich would be able to partake in. And none of us could. So you're watching, you're saying, oh my gosh, look at that garage, look at those cars. You know, This is incredible, but really such a small percentage of people live like that. Most everybody else just gets to watch about it on TV. And so as we think about these things, there's something attractive about it to us. The reason that show was so popular is because people wanted to dream a little bit. They wanted to see what it's like on the other side. And then when they think about it, they're like, you know what? I wouldn't have five Lamborghinis. I should have one. And I'd give the rest of that money away to the poor. We start to think about what we would do if we had all that money. And so every once in a while, when we're able to, we try to save so we can get away to a vacation. You know, we can go to the Dells. You can go to Cancun. If you have enough, you can save up enough. You can go to Italy. You can go someplace and be pampered for a week so you can experience what it's like not to have any cares because we like that life. It's attractive to us, and it's understandable why. So Jesus is building his parable, his teaching, and he's starting out with this idea of the rich man who had everything that he needed. And at his gate, here comes the contrast, and at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. Lazarus, the only person to be named in any one of Jesus' parables. This is made up. He just picked a name, but the name means something. You'll hear it as we keep going. Lazarus is... Um, Hebrew, it's Eleazar. It means God has helped. So he chose the name of the man to be God has helped because you're going to see that God has helped this poor man. It says that he has sores over his body. If you've ever gotten a paper cut, it doesn't feel good. You put salt on that, it hurts. If you've ever got a regular cut, you don't want anything to touch it because of the pain. I have a mild form of psoriasis, and so uh, my uh, skin, it cracks my hands. I, so I always put lotion on because I, uh, as it's dry outside, my skin cracks, and sometimes it'll peel and crack to a place where there's open wounds. And so I got to cover it and I got to take care of these things. That's why I love to go to humid places, Arizona, uh, Hawaii. One time I went to Hawaii, India, because when I'm there for that season, everything is great. I was like, this feels good. Then I come back here to winter and it hurts and I can't carry things sometimes because my skin is broken. Imagine if you had sores over your whole body. Jesus is painting a picture that this poor man is in absolute pain all the time. This is the difference between these two people. The rich man is covered in fine clothes and the poor man is covered with sores. Who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. The poor man wanted some food. He just wanted some crumbs to fall off the table. Kind of like a dog who sits there waiting for anything to come off of the table. If you have a dog, you know what I'm talking about. Even the most obedient dogs that you have are waiting eagerly for a crumb to fall off the table. And our dog, he sits around the weakest link. And when somebody else comes into the house, they're looking for the weakest link. Who is the person who's going to drink? Drop something, and our dog always sat around the table where Josiah sat because there would be a lot of food, crumbs falling. I could be cutting food in the kitchen, and I'm using that knife, and my dog who sleeps 20 hours a day, I can see him, and he perks up, and he just looks. 
And then he hears, no matter where he is in the house, he's cutting. You call him, you know, hey, call him, no, nothing. But as soon as that carrot falls on the ground, yes, the jingling of the collar, the feet on the hardwood, and he comes right over looking for it. And we just point him in the direction for the crumb. Jesus describes this man like a dog waiting for a crumb to fall from the master's table, covered with sores, wanting to eat a crumb that could fall off and maybe satisfy him for a moment because you know that a crumb will not satisfy. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. There he is lying at the gate. This is a made-up story. Jesus is using an extreme example. And as he's there lying at the gate without any food, covered in sores, the dogs come and lick him because they want to taste that blood and the open sores. Like, that's disgusting. Jesus is painting a picture of absolute poverty on earth. A person who has nothing here on earth. This week, we had the opportunity with our community group to go to Feed My Starving Children in Libertyville. And so we went with kids and adults and, you know, older ones of us and younger ones, and we packed food. It's such a beautiful ministry. We've done it three times, I think, in my life. If you've never done it before, you should take advantage of this. You go and you pack food, dry foods, and it's sent to the poorest of the poor around the world. And it's started by a Christian organization. It's a nonprofit, but it's Christian. It's a ministry. Because when we follow Jesus, we can't help but be compassionate. Some people will read this scripture and they'll think, oh, this, this, I see what's going on here. You need to do good works in order to be saved. That's the problem with the rich man. But that's not the problem here. The problem isn't even that he's rich. The thing isn't that the person's poor. The problem, the issue is what's going on with the Pharisees is they've really abandoned God. They've rejected God. They've gone after their own way and set up their own rules. And so this is a picture of a person who is walking on their own, who ultimately will just do whatever they want to do. See, when God changes our heart, then he makes us love people more. And so when I come to God, then in repentance, then I want to serve God and I want to serve people. That's why we love God. We love people here. Jesus makes it so clear. And so this is a picture with his uncompassionate attitude towards the poor man of a person who has rejected God. Now, knowing the teaching of Jesus so far, we see him talking about the poor pretty regularly in the scripture. The gospel of Luke, one of the themes is God's heart for the poor. When Jesus gets up to preach his first sermon that's recorded in uh, the gospel of Luke, we studied this, Luke 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 18, he says that he has anointed me anointed for this, to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight for the blind, to set at liberty to set at liberty those who are captive. The year of the Lord's favor is upon us. This is what Jesus says. And so good news to the poor, because the poor don't get good news in everyday life. Oh, you're late on your payment for your electric bill, no electricity. You didn't pay your, uh, your, your, your note on your car, your car is repossessed. There's not a lot of good news for those that are poor, but Jesus comes and he says, I got good news for you. I got good news that even if things aren't great here on earth, you can be reconciled to God. And as more and more people get this idea of the kingdom of God, there's going to be more and more care provided for you. And one day you can be with me forever. There's good news for those that are poor. God makes things right. He corrects it. He reverses things in his time. As we study through the Gospel of Luke, this is just Luke. We could have gone to Matthew, Mark, or John also and seen so many examples of Jesus' heart for those who are poor, who are outcasts, who are discarded by society. Luke chapter 5, there was a leper who wanted to be clean, and Jesus healed him, had compassion there was a paralytic who was let into a house where Jesus was teaching by his good friends. And as he came down, Jesus is interrupted in his teaching. And there he was, and he healed the man. He had compassion on him. Like countless people who he healed on the Sabbath of their illnesses, even though the Pharisees hated what he was doing. Like the man in Luke chapter 10, which we studied on the road to Jericho, he was beaten and discarded. And the priest and the Levite walked by on the other side, but... The Samaritan took care of him and showed compassion for him. Like the lost son in Luke chapter 15, two weeks ago, who was about to eat the slop of pigs 
and he came to his senses and was embraced, and a feast was given for this boy who had lost everything. See, the heart of God is one of compassion. And once we follow Jesus... We are turned on to this, and we want to be people. We're going to be people who are compassionate, but this rich man doesn't care. He can't be bothered. He's got his stuff. He's got his needs, and so we want to be careful about these things. So I want to give you a couple ways that you can grow in compassion, ways you can grow in compassion. First thing is slow down. Just slow down. We're always late for places. We're late, and because we're late, we're rushing, we're running. We run so fast that we miss all of the people that we could be helping. We miss people that we could be blessing. When I was, um, I had my first job here in Chicago, I would take the red line from the north side, we lived up near Lakeview, and take it up to downtown Chicago. The job I had was on Lakeshore Drive, looking out over the water at the American Bar Association. But I had a walk from the red line all the way up to get to my place. And I'm a newer believer at this time and just very eager to share my faith, to try to figure out what my life is supposed to be about. And so I would be late also because I was young. I was in my 20s. So I'd be running and late. And uh, there's all these homeless people on my way up. And I was like, gosh, if I had a little more time, but I don't want to be late, if I had a little more time. And so then I just started to make a little more time. And then I would pack some sandwiches, and I'd have those sandwiches with me, and I would take them on the train, and I would just have them in a bag, and I'd just pull them out as we talk and give them a Ziploc bag with a sandwich in it. Just talk for a moment, buy a streetwise. If you slow down, you can see people. You can look at them. But if you're moving fast, how many times have you noticed a person, you're going 75 miles on the highway and they're going 75 miles, you never notice what they look like, and yet when you're stopped in traffic and you look over, you see a person. Because when you slow down, you see people. Slow down. Second thing you can do to grow in your compassion is be interruptible. Be interruptible. Just, you know what, I know you got your work and your schedule and your things you need to do, but be interruptible. You know what? God may have brought this person to me right now because I needed to talk to them, because they needed something that I have, and so be interruptible. Like Jesus, as he's there, and he's walking through the crowd, and he says, who touched me? And his disciples say, who touched you? We're in a crowd. Everybody's touching you. That's what they're thinking. Who touched me? Because I felt power come out of me, and this woman who was sick, she was healed, and Jesus, he is interruptible. There is no place or time that Jesus isn't willing to be stopped to ask a question, but we're so busy. Slow down, be interruptible. And then third, just be generous. Ask God for a heart of generosity, a heart of generosity. Somebody you know is in need uh, in response to this message last week. It was just so beautiful. I think it was in response to the message. A uh, man in our church, he came up and he said, I, I, I'm going to give you five envelopes with $200 each in them, and we want to give Christmas dinner to some families. We don't want them to know who it's from, and we don't care who you all pick the families. Because we have, and some may not have a great Christmas dinner this year, and move with compassion. Do you see what happens in our hearts? There's just this, it's all the Lord's anyway, and it's such a hard thing with wealth. That's why Jesus uses wealth so much. Again, not wrong or right to be wealthy. It doesn't matter, but does it have a hold of your heart? Do you follow God? And if you follow God and you're wealthy, you're going to be a generous person. You can't help it. There's this dangerous theology that's going around in the world. It's prosperity theology. It's name it and claim it. It's people teaching that you can use the Holy Spirit like a magician. And if you just say it and you have enough faith, then it will be done. You command it in Jesus' name and it will be done. And if it's not done, where's your faith? You need more faith, and the way that it's applied the most in the world is through wealth, through money. And so preachers speaking about these things, they've got to show that this is true, and so they have more and more. And meanwhile, it's happening all over the world. Every country has these things going on. And then the people that really want favor from God who are struggling, who are poor and at a gate with sores on their bodies or giving whatever they can so that someone can get richer. So they can be an example of what it means to have real faith. And you see this all over, and it's so tragic what's happening. It's not wrong to be rich, but it is wrong to use the Word of God to prosper yourself. There's an Instagram account called Preachers and Sneakers. I don't know if you've ever seen this. 
I had no idea. I'm not like really into fashion or anything. People say, like, that's a nice jacket. I'm like, I don't even know where I got it. I don't, I'm, I'm, and it's fine if you, if you want to have nice things. It's all good. These are Timberland shoes. I, don't, I think I got them at DSW. I'm just not into that. I just don't get it. I'm not into it. That's me personally. And I don't judge anybody. I don't judge anybody. But preachers and sneakers, it's an interesting uh, look into the life of wealthy preachers in America. And um, shoes, I had no idea. Thousands of dollars for shoes, like 5000 8000 for sneakers. I couldn't believe it. I had no idea that this actually was a true thing. And so they put the shoe, and then they show it in context being preached in, and then they put in a price tag on the actual shoe. And it's just, oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. And then I was clicking down the rabbit hole, and I saw profits and watches. Oh, man, I saw prophets and watches, and there was a pastor in England who had a $329,000 watch on his wrist. And then I went down the rabbit hole a bit more, and I clicked a bit more, and I saw him with his Lamborghinis. And he's driving a Lamborghini to church. And then I clicked a bit more, and he says, it's so that people can see that they too can be blessed. And so that's why we do what we do. And on Prophets and Watches, you scroll a little bit further, and there's John Piper. You guys know John Piper, Bethlehem Baptist? He's a simple man, and John Piper's there, and his wrist is shown, and it's a Casio watch. <laughs> and they put $10. <laughs> and then there's a warning. They're like, John Piper knows that we're coming after him. And so he's flaunting his $10 Casio watch. Now, listen, I have no judgment on any of these people. I don't know. Do they give millions and millions of dollars to the poor? Are they worth a billion dollars and they give millions away? I don't know. It might be that case. You could have great watches here. You could have great shoes. I don't care. I don't care. I don't mind it. Don't be like, oh my gosh, here's my watch. I got to hide it from pastor because he's, no, I don't care. I don't care. Have whatever you want. Some people look at my life. They're like, gosh, he, he's got this or that. That's a little extreme. you know. I don't care. I'm not going to be judged by you. Who is it? 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This, the the other, other services didn't get this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says, uh, I won't be judged by you, Paul says. I don't even judge myself, he says, for the Lord is our judge. But you should look at your life and say, am I drawn to wealth in this way that is pulling me away from the heart of God for the world? Because it can happen. It's dangerous. Trust the Lord Put your trust in Jesus and then follow him to the poor, to the needy, to those that are right around you and be compassionate. See, there's a pull that money has. It's not right or wrong. It's just true. Everybody knows it. That's why Jesus talks about it so much because there's this pull. We would like to have more. Trust the Lord and be compassionate. Compassion over selfish greed. Verse 22 continues. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. We're considering an unexpected reversal. Compassion over selfish greed. And this next, the justice of God over worldly favor. The justice of God over worldly favor favor. This is the reversal. It's right here. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. After Lazarus died, notice the words that are used. He is carried. This isn't actual. This is a story. Jesus is illustrating. He's trying to paint a picture. This is the kind of care that happens for Lazarus. Clearly, if Lazarus is going to Abraham's side, it's not just because he was poor. It's because he is the example of someone who follows God. You got to look at the whole context of scripture. He is one who follows God, who tries to obey the commands. He's trying to do the right thing in life. And here he is now. He is carried to Abraham's side. He is in heaven with Father Abraham. It's a picture that's being painted. And at the exact same time, at the exact same moment, the poor man dies and the rich man dies. They both die. The rich man then is buried. He's buried and he is put into hell. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Here's the reversal. It's unexpected. The person that always wins in life, are you telling me that they may lose in the end? I'm not saying it. Jesus is saying it. You can see the reversal. Lazarus is carried 
The rich man is buried. And this is the reversal that we see. He's in Hades. He is in torment. I don't enjoy teaching about hell. I don't wish anybody to ever go there. It is not a good place. And Jesus himself, if you have a red letter Bible, these are Jesus' words. This isn't made up by man. This is Jesus himself teaching, trying to warn people of this is what is reality. That there is a separation coming for those that are outside of the faith. And if you're outside of the faith, then it is torment. It's not good. It's not pleasant. It is burning. It is anguish. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham. Can you picture him there? He's in torment in hell. This isn't an actual story. This is just illustrative. Jesus is trying to paint a picture. He's there and he's hell and he's in torment in Hades. And he looks up and far off, he sees, who is that? That's Abraham. I'm actually supposed to be with Abraham. All my friends, they said so. Everything was supposed to go this way. I, I'm supposed to be with Abraham, and yet I'm here in torment. And who is, the, who is that by his side? Man, the face, it looks like Lazarus, but look at his skin. It's so clear. There's, there's no sores anywhere. That, that's Lazarus. Lazarus was at my gate. The dogs, my dog used to go out for a snack. What is happening here? This isn't right. And he's in anguish seeing what could, could have been his but is not. It's getting clearer and clearer. Lazarus, who was nothing, a zero on earth, has everything in eternity. The great reversal. It's an upside-down kingdom. It doesn't make any sense to us. But this is the heart of God. He is compassionate. He is trying to reach people before they die. The rich man had hoped he'd be by, by Abraham's side, but he's not. Verse 24, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. So he calls out. He's asking, please, Please help me. This is why I know it's a Jewish person, why Jesus is using an example. This is a Pharisee, somebody who claims to follow God, but isn't following God. And so now here it is, Father Abraham. Only the Jewish people would have said that, Father Abraham. So he is supposedly a religious person. And he thought he should have been at his side. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water Dip the end of his finger in water. I just want a drop of water. Look at the reversal. Look at the change. In life, Lazarus was getting a crumb of bread. And now, in death, the rich man wants a crumb of water. Can I just have a little taste? Because it is so hot here. It is burning. It is torment. It doesn't feel good. Can you just please send him? And he was my servant back then. I used to send him down the street to go get a newspaper for me and go get a drink. And now I want you to send him to me again to try to cool my lips. But Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. And Lazarus in like manner bad things. And now he is comforted here and you are in anguish See, this is how I know the heart of God and the heart of Jesus is so tender. There is no joy in any person being in hell. Because even now as he's saying it, it's not, you know, you foolish. It's not like that. It's just my child. There's nothing that can be done now. It's too late. There's a great chasm, a large Valley, if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you can't just hop over because there's a large chasm between and it is fixed. It is set. We can't do anything about it. It's a hard teaching. In the rich man's life, he received good things, well taken care of, had clothes and food and everything he wanted. But now, here it is, the reversal. He's got nothing. And in Lazarus' lifetime, he received all the bad things, and now he's got all the good things. This is the unexpected reversal, the upside-down kingdom. It doesn't make any sense to us and to the world. And besides all this, between us, I already talked about this, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from us to them. This unexpected reversal of favor can't be reversed after death 
it is time sensitive. It's time sensitive to think about what it would be like to be in pain with flames. Jesus is describing what it's like to be in torment in hell. And they use flames. I mean, I, if this was on my skin, I wouldn't be able to tolerate it. And there's flames that are burning. This is the description throughout the scripture, a place of weeping and gnashing teeth. This is separation from God, and it does me no joy to even talk or think about some who might end up there. It's not a good thing. It's not a good feeling. And so any of you who've ever told a person to go to hell, I hope those words would never come out of your mouth again because you think about how hard and how deadly and how tragic and how painful torment would be forever. And somebody who's hurt you so much where you would want them to go to hell, I hope you would love them like an enemy and pray for them and share with them and forgive them because we want them to also come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and to be with him forever. This is not a pleasant thing to talk about or to even think about. But Jesus wants those who are listening to know that there is a time to decide and a time to follow, and that time has to happen while you still have breath. After you are dead, it is fixed. It is a great chasm. The rich man, you know, he's got no name. It's interesting. He's got a title. He's rich, but there's no name. He's just a rich man. Your title won't help you in eternity. Your title that you work so hard to climb the ladder to get, it's not going to help you. What are you, a CEO? That's great. It's not going to help you on the other side of eternity. You'll just be a CEO in hell. There's a lot of titles I see here. There's pastor in the back. It's not going to help you. There's consultant. There's business leader. There's teacher, there's a contractor, there's a doctor, there's a police officer. Your titles will pass, but your name, that's why Jesus names him. That's why Jesus names him, so that you could know that God knows your name. So you could know that your name, this is beautiful, what Jesus says, there's a lamb's book of life. And your, your name is written there. Our names are written. How is that possible? How is it possible that our names are actually written in a book? Mohan, written out. I take it literally. And yet I'm with sin, and yet I go my way, and my name is written and it won't be blotted out, Jesus says. It is awesome to know that your name is written, but is it written? Or are you just going to swing out of eternity with your title, like the rich man? The prophet Daniel, he says this in Daniel 12.1. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who was in charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at, at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. That's the Old Testament. Here's the New Testament. Jesus himself, Luke 10, 20. We study this. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Your name is written in heaven Philippians 4, 3, Paul says this, even Paul knew, yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Revelation 3, 5, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. We confess Jesus' name, and Jesus confesses your name. Your name, not your title. It is your name, the name that you are given, and it is written in a book. 
Revelation 20, 15, though, says this, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus knows the name of his children. While there is still time to repent, turn to Jesus, because this is the reality. And he's trying to paint a picture to those that are listening that you can keep on going after your life however you want to live, but the end road of that kind of life is always the same. It is separated from me forever. Or you can repent. You can repent. Your names are written in the book of life. The unexpected reversal, it's coming. If you live for yourself now, the picture of the rich man, without God, it's eternal suffering. But if you live for God now, the picture of this poor man, it is eternal comfort. It's a reversal. It's a great reversal. It's unexpected. Verse 27. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The unexpected reversal, compassion over selfish greed, the justice of God over worldly favor, and finally, the word of God over miraculous signs. It's so clear. The word of God over even a miraculous sign. Verse 27, he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. This is now the Second or third act in the parable. See all these reversals? They add a bit of spice. They add a flair. It opens up our eyes to see what the truth really is. And now the rich man begs Father Abraham to send him, Lazarus, to his house as a witness. The rich man's begging. For I have five brothers, so he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Five brothers, just like this one brother. They're all the same boat abandoned God, doing whatever they wanted, and he doesn't want them to be in this place of torment. Please send Lazarus to them as a witness. It's important to know it's as a witness, as a testimony of what it could be like. They will believe. Please go and testify. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets, again, like last week, it's all continuing. Jesus is in this one thought here. The Pharisees, they are lovers of money. You can't serve God and money. You can't have two masters. Not one iota of the law of the Lord will be removed. And so here it is. They have the law and the prophets. They have this. Let them hear that because they keep on rejecting. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. The rich man thinks that he knows better. They will repent If Lazarus were to go to them, they're going to believe, they're going to repent. They just need a sign. Just give them a sign. If they see a sign, I'm telling you, they will believe. They're they're going to do it. They're going to give it up. They will repent. And this is where Jesus lays out this truth in this parable that the problem with the rich man isn't his riches. Again, we got to be biblical. The problem with the rich man is he's unrepentant. He is outside of the faith. He doesn't want God in his life. To be repentant means to change your mind. That's all it means. It's a fancy word to mean I'm changing my mind. I'm turning away. I've taught this so often here. I can just picture it. I do this regularly. I'm going this way after the world and doing whatever I want to do. And then I realize that there's a Savior who loves me. And I turn. I've turned. I've changed my mind. I've gone to the cross. And I am covered by Jesus' blood. And I am pure again. And then I live my life. And this is the exchange that happens. That's what repentance is. The rich man, though, he was satisfied by all the stuff that he had in earth. He loved his purple Louis Vuitton outfits. He loved to eat at Morton's every day for the sumptuous food. He didn't want to follow God. He wanted what he had, and he wouldn't have traded it for the world. He wouldn't have traded it for eternity. Jesus knows the heart of men and women. Who is the richest man on earth right now? What would you say? Elon Musk. Yes. Joe Warbe is on it. Elon Musk is the richest. It's always this back and forth, you know. 
Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, who is it now? I just looked, the latest data, apparently. Uh, we'll see what the stock market does on Monday. It'll <laughs> One quarter of a trillion dollars, $250 billion. If you ask the richest man in the world today, would you trade your wealth? Would you give all of this up so that you could have eternity with God? He's a self-proclaimed, I'm not saying anything you couldn't find on the internet, himself saying it. I'm an agnostic or maybe an atheist. I believe in science and data. So this man who has everything that he wants at a moment's notice, this man, would you trade all that you see right now? You can jet set, you can leave, you can buy anything or anyone. What do you want to do? Would you like to be with God forever or and give up all of this and repent? What do you want to do? What do you think he would do? But if he saw a sign, oh, if, if he saw a sign, yes, until, just like all of us who've seen signs and have fallen back, until we end up also going back to the thing that is so much more attractive to us. See, Jesus wants us to understand that this person in this text, it's not about how much money they have. It's about that their heart is hell-bent on being without God. They want to do whatever they want to do. If you don't want God in life, you won't have God in death. For those in the back and online, if you don't want God in life, you won't get God in death. And you are making a decision. But Jesus, he was here for 33 years or so to let us know the heart of God for people. He's a compassionate God. He is loving, and it's going to cost him his life. And so we still open up our mouths. We still try to let people know that God is doing miracles. We still do these things, and we open up the Word of God. But the Word of God is all you need for life and godliness. You don't need to see a sign. We have two opportunities to participate in inviting people to church to open up your mouth. You know, we've done this in the past here. We're going to go Christmas caroling, and um, it's uh, two weeks, Saturday the 18th. Uh, six o'clock, we're going to meet and then go to people's homes or some host homes. I think we could still use some other host homes, but that's after a service, and uh, we'll meet at somebody's house, maybe have some hot chocolate, pray, and then go to their neighborhood, and we'll sing some songs. And then somebody's going to go to the door and see if anybody has any prayer requests, anything we can pray. And that might open up an opportunity to just share our faith a little bit. We've done that in the past. And so there's opportunities. And you could do whatever you're comfortable with. You're like, I'm in for the hot chocolate and praying there, and I'll, I'll sing in the back, but I'm not going to the door. It's okay. You know, somebody will. But this is opportunity that you have to just start to get out of yourself a little bit. As we follow the Lord. So that's an opportunity. We'd love for you to participate in that. You can sign up online uh, on the uh, church app. Just go and uh, click that and sign up. It's going to be a great time together. And then there's another opportunity coming up. There's a film that was made by the people who've created The Chosen. And so uh, it's a Christmas film. It's already been in theaters and it's out. It was just a limited time. But we've, uh, we're paying for it. Uh, we're, it's a ticket. There's a price for, per ticket, and we're going to just cover all, the whole expense. It's an outreach for us. And uh, we've already sold out Friday's showing of this. It's a two-hour event. It's um, music and uh, also a, a Bible story about Jesus' birth. And so if you want to come to it, we've added another showing. It's going to be Saturday also right after the service. And so if you want to come, it's free, but you have to register and to come and you can bring people. And on the way out, you're going to get these little tickets. There's a QR code on there. They can scan that. They can sign up for the remaining time. It's Saturday now, remaining time. But maybe you want to invite some people to that. We'd love, I'd love to open up a third show if we need. There's opportunities that we have to be able to share with people. And some of you have been sharing with people for a long time and at some point, it's like they have the law and the prophets, you know. I'll keep on trying, but I think they are set in their ways. But you keep praying, keep looking for opportunities, keep being that person who they'll come to when there is a time of need. 
Verse 31, he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. See, we have the same problem that's happened throughout the ages. It started in Genesis 3, 6, and 7 when the first human beings ate that fruit and said, I don't want God. I actually want to be God. And so they wanted to be God themselves, and so they ate this fruit and they're cast out of the garden. And every problem that happens in the world comes from that moment. Every depression, every illness, every poverty, everything that goes on. You know, we look at the world and we see racism. We're like, why is this still existing? And it's like that also is because of the garden. You think about uh, what's going on right now even in the news with abortion and what's happening. And to think that somebody would ever take the life of a child that's got a heartbeat. How can we do that? And all of those things have their root back to Genesis 3, 7 and following where people did what was right in their own eyes. And so we wanted to just be God and then we wanted to just be without God. And this is the life that we have. But Jesus does something different. And Jesus here, he adds in a third reversal. I don't know if you saw it. They won't, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Who does that sound like? Jesus. All of them, they think he's talking about Lazarus. But he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is preaching about Jesus right now. They're not going to be convinced. The Pharisees that are listening, they don't get it. The Sadducees, they're not going to get it. The scribes, they don't get it. Even his disciples who are right there, they think, oh, he's talking about Lazarus. They don't get it either. And some of you who are here right now, you also don't get it. You don't understand because you haven't experienced what it's like for the risen Savior to redeem your life. But you can. You can be reconciled while there is still time before the great chasm comes at your death. Jesus, he's talking about Jesus. Luke 9:51. I've been talking about this so much that he set his face to Jerusalem. He's setting his face to the cross. He is making his move. Could Jesus have even said these words without a tear coming out of his eye? Jesus is going to die. He spoke the world into creation, and he himself is going to die. And those who I've created, they won't even believe when they see me alive again. He must not have died. He must have been close to death, and they took his body. It's the only way I can make an account for it, because signs don't change us. They can help, but ultimately it is about you saying, I see who I am in light of who God is, and I don't want to live that way anymore, and I want to be reconciled. And maybe there's some here today who are still walking in unrepentance, like the rich man. We have an opportunity to respond here, um, an opportunity to respond Uh, to the word of the Lord. This is an unexpected reversal. You can be saved. It's unexpected. You can be saved. It's unexpected because we're so sinful, and yet God made a way. When I was studying, you know, I'm usually in my office at home preparing um, on Saturday, going through my notes. I, you know, prepare my heart. I usually have earbuds in. I'm listening to worship music at that point, and as I'm listening to worship music, I'm just highlighting my notes and writing thoughts, and I'm just finishing up the last, it's the last part right before, and I'm prayerful as we're going. I'm thinking about people in the church as I'm reading these things. I'm preaching it in my heart and mind to people I know who might be struggling or might be outside of the faith, and I've thought about some of you even that are in this room today as I was reading this and preparing it. I had this a beautiful moment with the Lord on Saturday, and I was alone in my office, and family was trying to get the house ready for something, and I was just by myself, and uh, you know, Susan was coming in and out, and she didn't see it. I, I didn't actually want her to see, and so I had my head down in my notes, and I was just writing, praying, and this song came on. You know how the Lord does that. It was like the right time. It was this song by Shane and Shane, and I can't remember the words right now. I wrote it down. 
He says this, our, he, they wrote a modern hymn. It says, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. <laughs> I just lost it because, you know, we're sinful people, all of us, every person. And even a sinful person can get up in a pulpit and preach the word of God because we're changed, we're different. My sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Though our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Though our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, the song goes on to say. Praise the Lord. There's some of you who are still walking, just saying, I don't want that. I'm going to go my way. I'm going to take this chance over here. And the word of God is clear. There's a chasm and it is going to be fixed. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. You can't out sin the grace of God. So maybe this message was for you. I'm not going to assume, but we're going to have an opportunity to respond. If you are still dead in your sin, if you think you're going to get to heaven and by being a good person or by giving money to the church or by helping the poor or serving at Feed My Starving Show, if you think all these things are the things that's going to get you to heaven, you're going to have a rude awakening and it's torment. And I don't like to preach a message like this, but we want to preach the full counsel of the word of God. So if there's anybody here who is unrepentant and not Walking with Jesus, you have an opportunity today to respond. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have today to be able to worship you and hear from you. I pray, God, that you would move in the hearts of those here or online who are still unrepentant, who've just hardened their hearts, Lord, but maybe you're softening a heart. Maybe you're turning it, Lord. And I pray that you would do the final work. Uh, We thank you that you are faithful, that you are just, you are righteous. And even in your justice, you let us be righteous too, through the blood of Jesus. And so I ask that you would move, Lord, here. Just keep your eyes closed for a moment. Is there anybody here, just a first Group. Is there anybody here who's never confessed Jesus as Lord and you want to do that right now? If that's you, you can just lift your eyes up to me and, and then put your hand up so I can see. Is there anybody here who wants to confess Jesus as Lord? Unrepentant. Is there anybody? If you're online, you can just text Jesus. There's a phone number that'll come up in a moment. Just text Jesus to that number and We'll reach out to you. Is there anybody here? All right. Next group of people. Is there anybody here who has followed Jesus and yet you are, you've been a little bit cold. You've been a little hard hearted. You've been going after the world and you want to return to the Lord. If that's you, just put your hand up. I'm going to pray for you right now. Amen. Yes. Amen. I see your hands. Anybody else? Amen. The Lord sees you more than I seeing you. The Lord sees you. Amen. Father, I thank you for these hands that are raised, Lord. Two hands raised. I see you in the back. The Lord sees you. (laughs) Father, we ask that you would bring us to just a deeper faith in you. I pray you do that for me and for our church family, that we would be just people who run to you, God. We thank you for arms wide open. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for new life. God, of this Advent season, let it be a different kind of a Christmas for us. It's been a diff- difficult few years for so much of the world, and yet we rejoice. And we celebrate the coming of our hope-filled Savior to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.